one, two, three, six readers uh, this afternoon from Introduction to Fiction um, reading their work, which sounds anything but introductory to my ears. I think you're going to really enjoy it, those of you who are um, joining us for the first time. And I think we'll just get started. As I said, my probably overly ambitious plan is to unmute the speaker and keep you all muted and then unmute you after each speaker so that um, folks can have the benefit of a little bit of applause, which in my view is the main reason to read in public in the first place. So, um, all right, so uh, we're going to begin with Bariale Shalisi, whom I just usually call Baro, but I think I pronounced his name right. He's nodding at me. Yay, I did it. Okay, so Baro, you should be unmuted. Yes, and and you'll just tell me when to stop, right? Um, or well, should I stop? I, well, you timed it for about five minutes, right? I'll yeah. Keep an, I'll keep I'll keep an eye on it. Okay. Sure. Great. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Well, here goes. the The story is called Push Pull. At six four, Paul dwarfed Susan as she sat scrunched in her wheelchair. What did you think of my manuscript? He growled. Susan involuntarily shrank into the back of her chair. Do sit down, she snapped. Paul moved to the rustic hand-carved sofa across from her. Susan watched the muscles of his back ripple through his tight t-shirt and smiled. He moved like a well-oiled machine, smooth and harmonious. Through no fault of his own, close up, Paul felt menacing and dangerous. But at some distance, he reminded Susan of an overgrown St. Bernard puppy, happy, gentle, willing to please. The sofa groaned as Paul threw himself into it. Satisfied? Better, Susan responded. She cast her eyes around the living room. Sunlight cascaded in through the floor-to-ceiling picture windows. Like a sparrow in search of a tasty morsel, her eyes darted from the hand-hewn logs of the cabin to the Native American pattern upholstery of the furniture, the framed George O'Keefe posters hanging on the wall. Her eyes invariably came back to rest on Paul. Isn't this just the coziest cabin you've ever seen? She hugged herself in sheer joy. It's so secluded, so private, so safe. Yeah, whatever, Paul frowned. Did you like my manuscript? Susan burst out laughing. When Paul frowned, his unibrow had the uncanny knack of scrunching up like a caterpillar attempting to crawl off his face. The sound of her laughter made Paul cringe. It verged on hysterical, reminiscent of shattering crystal, sharp, clear, high-pitched. Everything about her had changed since the accident. With effort, Paul reiterated, well, did you? His deep voice bounced off the wall like the echoes of a bassoon rising from the depths of a canyon. Did I what? Susan innocently asked. She opened her blue eyes wide, her lips curved upward ever so gently, revealing the faintest hint of a smile. She was certain that she still loved Paul, but over the past few months, ever since the accident, Resentment eclipsed her love. Try though she had, she couldn't quite recapture that love. It bobbed and danced just below the surface. It was her therapist's idea that the two of them vacationed someplace remote, someplace far from the city, far from the scene of the accident, someplace where, perhaps with luck, they could reawaken their love. She had not confided to Paul her reason for choosing this peaceful and serene cabin. Paul slammed his fist on the coffee table. What little coffee was left in the bottom of his muck took wing, droplets landing on the tabletop. Calm down, she looked at him in the, in the eyes. Are you still going on about your manuscript? Even with him seated, she had to look up to make eye contact. I loved it. I've always loved your writing. You know that. That's what attracted me to you in the first place. Your insights, your sensitivity. You're a talented writer. Paul leaned back and sighed. You've always been my best audience. His brown eyes locked with her blue. He wondered for the millionth time, had it not been for the accident, would she have transformed into the manipulative, whiny person she'd become? Their love had always been perfect, natural, complete, a mirror of his parents' marriage. Now he was torn between love, guilt, sadness, and hatred, guilt that she had induced. The changes in her had wrought an unmistakable change in him. He hated himself for it, but he seemed powerless against it. He wished he could whisk her back to the days before the accident. They had been so happy together. She so vibrant and energetic, hiking forest trails at work, dancing all night when they were together. 
he leaned across the coffee table and gently brushed a lock of golden hair out of her eyes. I'm going on the balcony, she announced. I need some alone time. She laboriously got her wheelchair rolling. Paul jumped up to help. I can manage, I can manage, she said without so much as glancing at him. I have to do things on my own, be independent and self-sufficient again. She reached for his hand, her eyes saline pools. I know you want to help, but I don't want to be any more dependent on you than I already am. Once outside, Susan took a deep breath, filled her lungs with the fresh mountain air, the balcony had become her new safe place. A tear escaped her eye as she thought of the days now gone forever when she would scramble up a tree and hide in its branches lost in a book in daydreams. She had first resorted to hiding in a tree when still a young girl craving privacy from her baby brother, who in his guileless way hero worshiped her and tagged along wherever she went. As she grew older, she continued the practice anytime she wanted to be alone with her thoughts. She gazed across the man-made lake, the surface placid and unruffled. Even the ducks were motionless, frozen in place as if by a magician's capricious spell. In the distance, she heard the gentle gurgle of a hidden stream as it poured over river rocks and spilled into the pond. She noticed a new scent in the air, one that hadn't been there before. She sniffed, lilacs, the heady aroma of her all-time favorite flower was redolent on the warm air. A botanist by training, her dissertation had been on lilacs, syringa. By scent alone, she could identify more than a hundred cultivars. She closed her eyes and took another deep breath. Like the antenna of an ant, the fine hairs in her nostrils quivered as the familiar scent wafted across them. She smiled as she recognized the cultivar, the beauty of Moscow, syringa vulgaris, crossavita moscovi. She opened her eyes and scanned her surroundings, twisting her neck and torso, first in one direction, then the other. Sure enough, through the rails of the balustrade, she spied a hedge of lilacs just to the left of the cabin. Their newly opened, pristine white blooms glistened against the cerulean blue sky, appearing to mingle with the puffy white clouds that gently floated by. She smiled. Her nose never failed her. She wished she could stay here forever. The cool metal of the balcony rail sent a thrill up her arms as she lightly rested her fingers on it. Her eyes closed, seduced by the peace and tranquility. So I think that's about the five minute mark. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> and of course, for those of you in the class, you'll get the whole story shortly, so. It's a lot longer. <laughs> oh, cool. It's nice to think that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's, uh, that's who we are, right? It's just the classroom students? Yep. It, basically, I think there are a few others in there, but yeah. yes. We have a few guests. <laughs> are you picking up? Are you picking up? Muted all participants. Uh, yes. Sorry, did you have a question, Ken? No, that's okay. I was just wondering if you could see me. I cannot see you. You cannot? No. Why don't you work on that? Because I would like to. All right, I'm muting everybody. Do, do, do. It's, all right, you, but you can still hear me. Our next reader is going to be Pat Hastings, uh, coming to us live from a, a very exotic location. Pat? Oh, I need to unmute you, sorry. <sighs> Might not have been my best idea. All right, there we go. Pat? Yes, I'm on the Golden Gate Bridge, but oh, I'm go. not gonna jump. <laughs> Please don't. Okay, thank you everybody for taking the time to join our class and hi classmates, it's been a long time. This is called The Healed Heart. I'm the one with the broken heart, said Emma. We have to do what I want today. She tugged at her cutoffs, fixing her belt, which was twisted in the back. She'd been crying, her usually bright eyes dull and swollen. That sounds ominous, said Charlotte with a smile. She gave her long, dark hair a twist and secured it with a clip she'd taken out of the front pocket of her jean shorts. 
The two roommates were sitting in Emma's Honda Fit, parked outside their tall granite dormitory. I just need some peace, Emma said. She twirled her blonde hair between her fingers and looked down at her lap. Charlotte stared at Emma so long that Emma noticed and gave a showy grimace. The sea is calling us, Emma whispered. She made a come hither gesture with her hand and grinned. Then in a normal voice, she said, I already have on my bathing suit. She undid a few buttons of her faded work shirt to reveal a glimpse of her purple speedo. I want to bound through the waves and forget that my true love found a new love. I thought you might, said Charlotte. I brought my towel. Charlotte was already resigned to missing her philosophy class this Monday morning. She rested her arms lightly across Emma's shoulder. The pills and alcohol downed by a despondent Emma two nights ago had scared Charlotte badly. She hoped they'd scared Emma too, but she wasn't sure they had. Congratulations, you just won Geek of the Week honors again, Emma said to her, to Charlotte when Charlotte gathered books, grabbed her laptop and headed toward the door. It was close to six o'clock on Saturday evening and Charlotte was off to the library. She was used to the teasing, but Charlotte loved the quiet of the stacks when everybody else was out partying. You'll be sorry when I get summa cum laude when we graduate. If I graduate, said Emma, looking suddenly grim. What do you mean? Charlotte shot her a glance. Of course she'll graduate. We both will. Emma ignored her. She stood at her closet door, flipping aimlessly through the hangers. You have a date with Cameron, right? Charlotte asked. See you later, said Emma abruptly. Something was up. She clearly didn't want to talk and Charlotte wanted to get to the library. Charlotte gave a little wave on her way out. Charlotte remembered this exchange the next day after all the excitement died down. Had Emma already been planning it? Charlotte should have skipped the library and made her roommate tell her what was going on. It was almost 11 when Charlotte swung open the dorm room door and announced, I have returned. Emma never went to bed early. If she weren't over at Cameron's, she'd be awake, ready to talk with Charlotte about the events of the evening. The lights were on, but where was the music Emma usually blasted? Charlotte scanned Emma's side of the room. She saw the vomit by the bed, the empty bottle of scotch, scotch. She saw Emma's rumpled figure on the bed, and with horror, she saw a prescription bottle overturned on the side table. Charlotte ran to Emma's still form and tossed aside the tangled bedspread. Charlotte grabbed Emma by the shoulders. Emma's head lolled to the left. She was breathing, though. A piece of paper on Emma's bedstand caught Charlotte's eye. It was a huge heart in two jagged pieces. Racing over to her backpack, Charlotte fumbled for her phone and dialed 911. Then she ran into the hallway and yelled, help, please come, help. I'll leave it there. All right, I'm in meeting. Are we going to hear more? Uh, you'll have to read it this week anyway, okay. so. That's, what hap that's, that's the part of the story that happened before the other story that we read in class when they're at the beach, right? That's the night before. Yes. yes. Yeah. Cool. Love it. Can't wait. All right. I am going to mute everybody. Oh, and then I'm going to unmute. Yes, continue. And then I'm going to unmute. All right, and I'm going to introduce, I've unmuted Cheryl Marita. Cheryl, you ready? Right, yeah. All right. All right. Fiction, scary stuff. So it's, my title is, What Were You Expecting? It wasn't the razor wire or the stark cement walls of the Western Research Institute. It was that I was there with my big sister, Abba, not our parents. 
They wouldn't have let us do this. Come on, Renner. Mom and Dad would want us to do it. Dad always was a risk taker, even, even moving out here to Homestead. He told us to be brave. That's what we're doing. My legs were led. I'm scared, Abba. What happens if we die like Mom and Dad? A voice called out before Abba could answer. Abba, Renner, I'm Dr. Zhang. Welcome. You're the youngest vaccine trial participants. Sorry about your parents catching the virus at the 2040 Homesteaders Conference, but they'd be proud of you. Proud parents. Neither one made me feel better. Let's just get this over with. I need to get back home. The cows need to be milked. It's just us now. Dr. Zhang held his head to the retinal scanner and when the locked door popped open, he waved us through. We need to check you over before you get the vaccine. It's just five drops under your tongue. We'll give you some testing equipment to take home and then you can be on your way. The rest of the visit was easy and the lemonade drops tasted good. Abba drove home. She promised dad before he died she'd take care of me. Seems more like I take care of her doing all the outdoor chores. But she cooks and keeps the house in between her books. Her damn books about flying being a pilot. I miss mom and dad, but I have to garden, milk cows, groom our horses, herd the sheep. It's just too much. I closed my eyes and leaned against the window, pretending to sleep. I didn't like to talk anyway. I used to love mornings, singing with mom, helping with the chores. Now it was hard to get out of bed, facing all the animals alone, but Mercy bellowed to be milked. I'd been milking, mer I'd been mer milking Mercy by hand, like mom did. It wasn't easy, my forearms were sore. But when Mercy turned her brown eyes to me that morning, I felt a twinge in my head, weird. I felt more relaxed after the twinge, started humming a song I'd forgotten. Squeeze, relax, squeeze, relax, became almost like a meditation. We must have both relaxed. Mercy gave twice as much milk since the day mom got sick. I had to carry the full bucket carefully back to the house, but I turned and waved to Mercy, who'd gone back to her field. How stupid, waving at a cow, as if she could wave back. Mercy turned and flipped her tail. Hmm, crazy. Abba was at Grandma's oak table, reading a book as always, but looked up in surprise. What's made you smile? I don't know. It was just felt good to milk Mercy, and I got a tune in my head. Something Mom used to sing. Probably Abba. Bet the song was Knowing Me, Knowing You. They sang it as a lullaby. I wanted to be alone, so I went to my room and looked up the words to the song. I learned the words, and I he could hear Mom's voice. Sunset meant another milking session, so I trudged back outside. I used to love being outside. I hoped someday I would again. Mercy was already at the barn. Hi, Mercy. Let's get you set up so I can milk you. Mercy moved quietly into her place and twitched her tail right in my face. I laughed and started milking, but this time I sang the words. Knowing me, knowing you, we just have to face it. There's nothing I can do. I kept singing, but my tears dripped into the bucket. I had to stop to wipe my face. I don't want the I didn't want the milk to spoil. Then I heard or felt something. You can do this, honey. Your mama taught you good. I leaned forward and looked at Mercy's soft brown eyes. Mercy? Yep, that vaccine packed a wallop. Doesn't happen to older folks. They're too locked up, but it worked on you. You mean? Yep, the animal's been trying to find a way to tell humans they've got to stop messing with nature, so we decided to mess with the vaccine. Hope someone young would step up. What about ABBA? Not sure. 
Thou chill be an animal communicator. Doesn't really like us, but maybe something else can help you guys take care of the earth. Only way we're going to survive, and I want my babies to have some green grass to eat. I walked back to the house with another smile. Maybe there was something to live for. All right. I can't sing. Now you know. <laughs> <laughs> Great props for singing in front of a whole, a whole, well, 22 rooms of people, actually. Um, I love that. I love that story, Cheryl. Um, alrighty. Julia, can I say one thing? Of course. Can I? Cheryl, that was great. I loved it. And, oh. and our mom's mom, she couldn't really sing either. <laughs> Did you know? <laughs> <laughs> I love you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Jackie. Oh, alrighty. I am going to unmute and then I am going to coming to Elizabeth. Do, do, do. Where is she? She's on my list. Oh, there she is. All right. Okay, Elizabeth. Uh, um, Elizabeth Ireland is our next reader. Elizabeth, are you there? Elizabeth? Elizabeth? Hear me? Nope. Okay, let me, really? Okay, just a moment. Now we can hear you. Okay, all right. Okay, very good. Okay, I'd like to read. I tried to enable your video and you rejected my request. I, I oh, oh dear. <laughs> I didn't see that. <laughs> uh, okay, shall I start start my video? Uh, yeah, if you can, if you're able to start the video, otherwise just start reading. Let's see. Okay. And nothing is happening. Oh, oh yes, and here I am. Yay. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Julia. Hello, everybody. Okay. This is, um, uh, this is my second, uh, this is after the first um, part of my story. So, uh, this, the steps of Casa Casarina. The black and white photograph from 1935 captured a moment which turned into a romantic courtship and marriage of 55 years for Anthony and Ethel. The photograph showed a tall, royal poinciana flowering tree with feathery leaves in the background, along with tall, majestic royal palms. Wild poinsettias grew next to the road. On the grass in front of Casa Casarina Hotel stood Anthony, Ethel, Uncle Bill, and Cousin Pat. They were all dressed in shorts, showing their tanned bodies. The warm ocean breezes ruffled their hair. Everyone was beaming. Ethel was holding a popsicle. BJ heard the stories of Miami Beach during that winter, told and retold many times. Those were Ethel's favorite memories. It was a time of true romance. Ethel finished playing tennis at the courts across from Casa Casarina. She was dressed in the traditional tennis style of the day. She wore a white t-shirt, white shorts, white socks, and tennis shoes. She walked past the steps of Casa Casarina, the hotel where Anthony was staying with his relatives. They were staring there for the season. They were, hello, I've been watching you play tennis for several days. Would you like to play tennis with me? He sat on the front porch of the hotel with his feet propped up on the railing. Do you like to play, she asked. Yes, he said. Would you like to play tomorrow? I can play in the morning. I have the afternoon shift as a lifeguard. My lifeguard stand is several blocks down from here. Oh, I would like to. My grandmother likes to watch me play. Is it okay if she is a spectator? That's fine. Could my uncle Bill and his daughter Pat watch us play? Yes, it would be fun to have an audience. I am not that proficient, but I love to play. Anthony didn't mention that he won his letter in tennis in high school and his spare time in Miami Beach was spent practicing golf for the first Miami Beach Golf Open. Where are you from, asked Anthony. I'm from New York. My grandmother and I came here on the cruise ship SS Newport. We're spending the season here. Ethel was 19 years old. She had the exuberance and anticipation of a young woman whose dreams would come true. She had naturally wavy dark hair and a blonde streak bleached by the sun framing her face. She had a golden tan and a toned figure from swimming in the ocean and playing tennis every day. She looked like a star from the movie Dinner at Eight. As Anthony used to say, she had a good build. I'm from Shaker Heights, Ohio. 
my brother and I accompanied my uncle and his daughter on their trip here. My brother works at the Grand Floridian Hotel and I am a lifeguard. I am also here practicing my golf game. I have signed up to compete in the Miami Beach Golf Open and the Cleveland Open in June. He had success in his eyes and the focus to make his dreams come true. Anthony was staying at one of the nicest hotels on Ocean Drive. He was 23 years old and had dark hair and blue eyes. Dark Irish is how people described him. He looked like Tyrone Power. He was incredibly handsome. He was physically fit, watched his diet, drank orange juice every day, and swam in the ocean and played golf. He had a winning smile and a great sense of humor. People were attracted to him. Those were the first exchanges of words between Ethel and Anthony, while Ethel was standing on the steps of the Casa Casarina. Many important guests stayed at the Casa Casarina. It was different from the Art Deco hotels. The Casa Casarina was built in the style of a Spanish mansion. The wooden floors on the top floor of the hotel were salvaged from Christopher Columbus's home in the islands. There was a beautiful fountain of three maidens and a pool of water in the center of the courtyard. One of the guests at the hotel was Grau San Martin's son. His father was an exiled dictator from Cuba. The family disappeared in the middle of the night. Political foes were going to hurt them. Many years later, it was the home of Gianni Versace. He was gunned down in the same steps where BJ's parents met. In 1935, Casa Casarina was the best place to be in the most fashionable city. Miami Beach was called the Paris of the US. It was the ideal setting for romance. Anthony won the heart of Ethel and the first Miami Beach Golf Open. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so great. I can't remember. Are, did this start out? Are these the parents of the other characters? or are these? Yes, parents? that's it. It's the parents and how they met. Oh, wow. That's really just like kicking off. It's amazing. So much history. I love it. <laughs> wow. Okay. All right. I'm muting. Anybody need anything? No, you're all fine? Okay, good. All right. So, uh, continue. Our next reader will be... Find it on the list. Aha. All right, we are now going to hear from Ms. Marguerite Kearns. Marguerite, you with us? Uh, I'm here. Yes, um, you're next. Can, can, is, can you hear me? I can hear you fine. Okay, good. Okay. I'm going to read something called Armadillas or a Metaphor. I loaded your car with old magazines from the barn so you could drop them off at the Salvation Army. I'm getting your crap out of here before the real estate agent shows up. You should have asked me first, Randy. Let's get a jump on this clutter. You know me by now, tidy, orderly, compulsive. I yawned and preferred to sit down among the dust and stacks of paint cans. I didn't ask my husband to throw away my magazines, my precious National Geographics, especially one special issue about roadrunners in the West. I, I used the photos as writing prompts. You don't understand, he wouldn't let me finish. You're such a hoarder. I need these magazines. I'm a writer. You don't appreciate me getting rid of junk, not one bit. Randy took a drag on his marble as if performing on stage at a late night venue in Greenwich Village. We were alone in the barn, but he spoke as if he had an audience gathered to witness our exchange. See how unreasonable she is, my husband said, when nodding in my direction, where I stood dressed in a flannel nightgown covered with a black kimono robe. What's your beef with me anyway? You couldn't have had a better partner than me. And over there, get rid of that copy with the cover article about armadillos. I can't. Armadillos are a metaphor. Spare me. I'm trying to explain. Everything about you is an excuse. I should try for a reporter position at the Rocky Mountain News like Randy suggested? No way. I'd rather stand on my own two feet. Armadillos like me developed armor from being ordered around. Since I didn't adjust well to ordinary reality, I spent the summer months sleeping during the day in my burrow and emerging at night to root in anthills. Some folks describe my back and front as leathery. I escaped easily from awkward situations because of nine movable bands. My armored head and tail, complemented by thick skin and coarse hair, made it easy for me to thrive in Catskill Mountain thickets and brambles, feasting on grubs and beetles. 
to cross a river or stream, I puffed up my lungs, filled them with air, and swam like strikes of lightning. I could walk on river bottoms and hold my breath up to six minutes. I had the ability to jump three feet in the air, land on my feet, and yell, freedom, at the top of my lungs. There couldn't be any of him for me other than we shall overcome. A melody expressing a longing for freedom expressed by performer Pete Seeger and folks all over the world. I remember the hot night in jail on a potent image of a closed space, tight air, tense feelings. Back in my college days, jail was associated with a stand against injustice. I didn't expect to be arrested. Freedom. I love the sound of the word. As a young woman, freedom and had the most relevance when applied to issues of my personal freedom and my parents' discomfort with me and my social life as a young person. I'd been attending the Philadelphia area women's college when another student asked if I'd accompany her to Cambridge, Maryland to volunteer for a campaign to end job discrimination and desegregate public accommodations. As an undergraduate student with a sociology major, the social conditions raised in my coursework aroused my interest. The possibility of jail wasn't even on my mind. Though distant and remote, I read about collective grassroots power with the potential of breaking the back of Jim Crow, a tradition supporting segregated schools, separate accommodations in neighborhoods, poor paying jobs, and, and attitudes resembling fences and barbed wire. During the civil rights movement, conscience confronted institutionalized racism strengthened over the decades following the Civil War. After watching a television report of gas, tear gas exploding over a crowd during a street demonstration, I understood how a hallelujah spirit could fuel a protest movement. Walk, march, organize rallies, register voters, sing, and go to jail. That's it. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Marguerite. All right, I believe we just have one more uh, reader, unless someone else from class has shown up and become changed their minds. Speak now. All right, then I'm going to mute you. <laughs> I actually lost my whole story. You lost it? Yeah, in my computer. Oh, Ken, I'm sorry. This morning. Oh, no. Yeah. But you are you are a computer genius, so maybe you can find it. <laughs> no, I don't think so. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. Well, uh, I'll do it again. Okay. Well, that's it. Might be better this time. True. <laughs> <laughs> all right. I'm going to mute all of you. I am enjoying the capacity to mute people at will more than I probably should. Um. All right. Our last reader is Patty Keene. I'm very excited. To Hear what she's going to read because I've read a bunch of really great things by her in the last 24 hours. She's on a roll. <laughs> Thank you. I actually have two uh, two short stories. Um, the first one is 20,000 Years of Stories. Uh, it's a song that uh, a story that was inspired by John Prine's song, uh, Hello in There. The word assisted living rather than what it was, in fact, an old folks home, even a superior one at that, didn't make it an easy didn't make it any easier for Franny to swallow her situation and fate. Ever since she arrived, she was reluctant, if not defiant, to mingle with the other residents as if their old age was contagious, fearful of waking up one day with hunched over shoulders, an unimaginably slow and limping gait behind an unsightly metal walker, and of course, spittle incessantly drooling out of the corner of her paralyzed mouth. No, the more distance her the more distance between her and them kept her safe from their inevitable decrepit reality. I came to visit Franny as often as I could. I knew it was difficult for her knowing she had preferred to be surrounded by people at least 20 years younger than herself. We would sit in the lobby having tea by the fireplace and I so loved listening to her stories of her youth on the farm during the Dust Bowl years and her subsequent success as an architect in Los Angeles. On the good days, Franny would invite residents to join in our conversations. Listening to their collective experiences of their vast and diverse lives, it was not until Franny and I did the math and figured between the 250 residents, 
assuming they had an average age of 80 years, there were 20,000 collective years of rich and copious experience living in these halls. From that day on, Franny held court surrounded by her new friends, catching up on the boundless stories they told each other, bowing to, rather than shunning, their life's war wounds. The next one's called 13. It was my younger sister's 13th birthday. Christine and I had been playing hide and go seek nearly the whole day with the neighborhood kids when our mom called me into the house for the third time. She was losing her patience by then, trying to get dinner on the table by the time our dad came home from work. It was August where the days were long, warm, and carefree. Summer days back then always carried a certain sensory appreciation for me more than any other season. The sound of the neighbor's zigzagging lawnmower, the wafting scent of jasmine intermingled with the random squeals of children playing in the freshly cut grass, and the sun disappearing not long after half past eight, leaving that magical periwinkle blue hue in the sky. Those gratifying moments unfailingly repeated themselves until the day my sister turned 13. I was having too much fun to obey my mother's demand to light the barbecue. I loved lighting the barbecue, a job my dad taught me how to do that summer. Having only two girls, he taught me all the things he wished he could have taught a son. For me, it felt like a rite of passage and made my dad proud, which was no small feat. But this day, James, my next door neighbor, was teasing and taunting me more than ever, and I was giving it right back at him. It was obvious we had a crush on each other that summer. Helen, yelled my mom across the grassy field where we were all playing, please come light the barbecue. She had been inside preparing Chris's favorite meal of barbecue chicken, corn on the cob, fresh fruit salad and a watermelon shell carved out like a basket and a surprise dessert of chocolate cake baked in the shape of a bunny, Chris's favorite animal, piled high with chocolate frosting, pink frosting for the nose and ears and 13 colorful candles. It went without saying, my sister and I were the envy of all kids on the block because it was a well-known fact we had the most remarkable mom, if ever there was one. I just had to tag James out one more time to show everyone, but mostly him, who the fastest was between the two of us. We both knew it was me, but I had to prove to him, again, my athletic agility. The familiar woman's screams emanated from our backyard in such guttural anguish it forced all of us to stop in an instant, as if a moment in a photograph. Our heads turned to each other's, eyes wide open, not knowing if we should run toward or away from the screams. In spite of my trepidation, I ran as fast as my feet had ever run toward the agonizing inhuman shrieks. By the time I came tearing through the backyard gate, she was fully engulfed in flames, the last bit of her blue and white striped cotton dress consumed by the fanned flames from running back and forth in a state of panic. She fell to the ground, her screaming diminished, but for the ghostly sound of flames licking her body. I stood in horror, paralyzed by the inconceivable scene playing out in front of me, only to be jolted out of my shock by my own screams of, Mom, no, Mom. I went for the hose by the side of the house and doused her body with a flow of water, white smoke rising, obscuring the grisly sight. My remarkable mother laid on the singed grass, motionless, a small whimper coming from her unrecognizable face. There are no words for what I have undergone mentally after this incident, as my mother, as my father and sister call it. I have often wondered why they chose that word and not accident. We've never been sure what happened exactly that day, but we knew no, she went to light the barbecue and somehow her dress caught fire. Wow. Mm. I love that the story starts with that barbecue and you're just lulled into thinking they're having a barbecue and then that's how it ends. Yeah. <laughs> I think that's all of our readers. Did anyone have any comments or questions for the writers today? Beautiful on everyone's part. Thanks. Thanks for doing that. So nice to hear all this work. Um, well, I just want to really quickly thank uh, Val, who um, always helps us with these events that are in the real world. Oh. And put all of this up. Thanks, thank Val. You, Val. Thank you, Val. And thank, thank you so much Kate, to Kate, who runs the department and is, uh, I don't, I assume you all know Kate, but she is a lifeline yes. of positive helpfulness. So um, <laughs> I look forward to seeing her in the hallways. <laughs> <Hey>. <laughs> 
All right, everyone. Well, if you're in our class, you will hear from me shortly. I'm going to go set up our workshop uh, discussion forums on Canvas, and I hope.